Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 126, which reads as follows. Gabham meke upajanti nirayang papakamino sagang sugatino yanti parinim banti anasava which means some arise in a womb the evil doers papakami papakamma the evil doers nirayang go to hell sagang sugatino yanti the people with good destinations people who have gone to good go to heaven sangha parinibanti anasava those without any taints are released go to full release parinibanti so four different destinations for four different types of people the story behind this is apropos it's one of the more poignant stories in the Dhammapada. Not long, but uh, has some quite interesting ramifications. So the Buddha was dwelling in Jetavana and there was a monk, Tissa, which uh, is the name of a lot of monks, so it seems to have been a common name at the time. But uh, he was an Arahant, it seems. And he had, for 12 years he had taken his meals in the house of a certain jeweler. And they had treated him well, like mother and father, the text says. They were good people. They weren't enlightened people, but they were good people who were very kind and, and very devoted to him. But it so happened that one day that... Um, the king, King Pasenadi, had sent a jewel worth a lot of money to the jeweler, telling him it should be cut and and uh, set in somehow to do something with it, whatever they do with jewels, with uh, precious stones. And um, when, when the messenger brought it, the, the jeweler was busy cutting up meat, and so his hands were covered in blood. And, uh, yeah. and so, but even, even, though, even so, he, he picked up the jewel, and he put it in, a jewel, in the jewel box, in this, this box, sitting on his desk, uh, with his hands covered in blood, so it had this sort of blood on it. Or at least it had the smell of blood on it. And so uh, then the elder came in for alms, and the uh, the jeweler went into the back to prepare food for the for the monk. And it so happened that there was a, a heron. The jeweler had a pet bird, a heron, that lived in the house. And uh, so happens that the heron wandered over to the desk, smelt the blood, and saw this jewel, which was maybe a ruby or something, and mistook it for a piece of meat. And right in front of the elder, uh, ate the jewel. And the elder watched as this bird uh, popped this jewel into its mouth, swallowed it whole, and then wandered away. Now the jeweler came back, and this is where it gets interesting. As the jeweler came back and found that his jewel was missing, and started freaking out, you know, looked at the elder, but didn't want to believe, of course, that the elder took it. And so he went to his wife and to his uh, his son and asked them, "Did you take this jewel? What happened to it?" And they, no, they, they didn't take it. And so, of course, he trusts them. But then he says to his wife, it must have been the monk. The monk must have seen it, and, and I can't believe it, but the, it must have been him. And the, his wife scolded him and said, how could you, know, don't say that. All, the, all these years he's come to see us, and he's, he's never exhibited a single flaw, you know, let alone the uh, evil, that would, evil desire that would cause him to steal someone else's belongings. And so the jeweler 
accepted this and went to ask the monk and said to the monk, did you take the jewel? Now, you might wonder, you know, well, why didn't he just say that the, the heron took it? Why wouldn't the elder just solve the problem for him? Because you see, the heron had swallowed the jewel and the only way to get it out, or the, only, you know, the most reasonable way to get it out would be to kill the heron. And so, in order to protect the heron, he didn't tell the... He, that was his reason for just saying, no, I didn't take it, and keeping quiet. He didn't want to get involved because he knew the consequences of getting involved for the heron. And so he says to him, look, there's no one else here. My wife and sons, they, they say they haven't taken it, so it must have been you. There's no one else. And the elder just stayed quiet. And so he went to his wife and he said, you know, it's got to have been the elder. I'm going to torture him, torture him and get him to tell me, because he's freaking out, really. It's this whole deal with kings, you know, the king um, is not to be trifled with. And, of course, he's not going to buy that he lost it. That doesn't really work. So he knows that it's going to be on his head if the king you know, finds out that he has lost the jewel. And he says, so I'm going to torture him. And then the, the wife forbids him and says, don't ruin us. So she says, it's far better for us to become slaves than to lay such a charge at the door of the elder. And the jeweler says, were all of us to become slaves, it would still be, uh, we would still not be worth the value of the jewel. The jewel is worth more than our slavery. You know? So they're saying, speaking of slaves, that jewel, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, we're not just going to become slaves, we'll probably be executed. And so he does something curious I don't quite understand. He puts a rope around the elder's head, binds it really tight, and then starts hitting him on the head <laughs> with a stick or something. Blood streamed from the elder's head and ears and nostrils, and his eyes looked as though they would pop out of their sockets. He really got a beating. And he never once said that the heron um, ate the darn thing. And so he, overwhelmed with pain and blood coming out of his orifices, he fell down on the ground as he was being beaten. And the, the heron, smelling the blood, came over and started to drink this, this elder's blood. And the jeweler saw this and he was overwhelmed with anger and just consumed with his you know, horrible, evil mind state. He yelled at the heron and hit it with a stick and killed it. And the elder saw this you know, through his bloody haze and asked, him, asked the lay person, he said, is the heron dead? And the lay person said, you're next. You're going to be dead. In, in, if you don't tell me where that jewel is, you're going to be dead just like it. So taking that as a sign, as an answer that this heron was dead, the elder said, immediately said, it was the heron that swallowed the jewel. He said, However, had the heron not died, I would sooner I would sooner have died myself than have told you what became of the jewel. And disbelieving, the, he pulled apart the heron and, and opened up its innards, and sure enough, found the jewel. And yeah, you can imagine how he felt at that point. He felt really, he, he kneeled down prostrate at the elder's feet asked his forgiveness and please, please forgive me, this was out of ignorance. And, and the, the elder, you know, um, in the manner of enlightened beings said, it wasn't your fault, it wasn't my fault. It's the fault of the round of samsara. So it's a part of existence to suffer like this. This is a part of the game. It's just how it goes. Totally absolving the guy, right? And so, still mortified, the jeweler says, well then, you know, please continue to come here, really uh, don't, don't, please don't stop coming here just because I beat you almost to death. And the elder gave a really um, sort of moving, moving speech. He said, it was because I came into someone, it's because of going into people's houses. Like this is actually a thing, some monks will not go into people's houses, they'll only take what's given at the door because this sort of thing happens. You get in trouble when you 
go into people's houses and the rules are really, in, monastic rules are really interesting and you really start to get a feel for wanting to keep them for reasons like, not this, but this sort of thing that happens. You start to, I mean, being a monk is, is kind of like that. So anyway, he says, henceforth I shall never receive alms under anyone's house. But the interesting thing is whether he was trying to just uh, spare the man's feelings, but he knew. He, he, it seems like he may have known that he was dying because actually he died uh, as a result of the injury. Uh, but before, so what he said is he, he actually spoke a stanza that isn't part of the Dhammapada, but it's in the commentary. He said, Food is cooked for the sage, a little here and a little there, in one house after another. I will journey about on my round for alms, a good stout leg is mine. Those are the last words, maybe, of the elder. Long, not long after he spoke them, he passed into Nibbana. The heron was born, if you're interested, as the story goes, was born in the mother's womb, uh, the, the wife. Uh, as her son or daughter. The, wife, the, the husband, when he passed away, was born in hell. And the wife was born in heaven as a result of never doubting the elder and, and trying to stop her husband from being such a jerk. So, the monks asked the, asked the Buddha about these four people, these four beings the heron, the wife, the husband, and the monk. Or they maybe just asked about the monk. And So the Buddha said, Monks, living beings here in this world, some re-enter the womb. Others who are evildoers go to hell. Others who have done good deeds go to the world of the gods, the world of the angels. Well, they that have rid themselves of the taints pass to Nibbana. And so he taught this verse. So the most interesting part is the part of the story where the elder doesn't um, give up the heron, right? Doesn't save himself by condemning the heron to death, which is typical of enlightened beings. Um, I mean, it's really an understatement. It's one of the most profound beauties of an enlightened being. They're just so, you know, it's a purity that, that surprises. You know? I mean, you think, okay, they're pure, but surely they're not going to give up themselves. They're not going to allow themselves to be tortured, but yes, actually they're that pure. Their minds are so pure that being beaten to death doesn't bother them. It's that much strength. It really is an invincibleness. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a example for all of us. Ask yourself, if I was being beaten to death, how would I feel? And then, curious is what he said, I mean, the, 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 the corollary is that because um, to be upset, even when being beaten to death, is to misunderstand. I mean, being beaten to death is just part of reality. There's no person being beaten. It's just an experience. The body is being uh, altered, and there's experiences of pain arising. But they're still just experiences. There's nothing good or bad about them. And so he had no problem forgiving this guy, or even telling him that there was nothing to forgive, because in the eyes of an enlightened being, there really is nothing to forgive. It's just part of samsara. There's mind states arise, and the mind states lead, lead to body states. The body states arise, lead to mind states, and so on. So body is a cause for mind, mind is a cause for body. It's just how things go. There's no good and no bad. In the end, but for those of us living in samsara and, and concerned, it's, it's worth noting that not every path leads to the same destination. I mean, they all still lead to samsara. Actually, going to heaven is part of samsara. Going to hell is also part of samsara. Being born in a womb, also part of samsara. The only thing that's not is how enlightened beings go to Nibbana. Anasava, those without Asava, those without taints. So how this relates to our practice, I think the most important point is this example that the Arahant sets for us, this purity um, of not being concerned for one's own welfare, not even taking that into account. 
Now, you could argue that um, in most cases, an arahant, and it seems, they would be concerned uh, in the sense of concern for the other person's welfare. And obviously, it's a tragedy. The tragedy is not that the arahant was beaten, although it's a tragedy that he had to die, uh, because arahants are, of course, the greatest of beings. But uh, it's, it's a, the, the great tragedy, or a great tragedy, is for the, uh, for the jeweler. He's the one who you should feel sad for, feel sorry for. And there's a sense that arahants are perfectly fine with, uh, with, that, with death, right? I mean, it's, it leads to freedom. For an arahant, uh, death is freedom. So there's no problem there. But for this jeweler, it's a big problem. I mean, it's the concept of how suffering doesn't lead to suffering, happiness doesn't lead to happiness. It's not the case that suffering is bad. Suffering is not bad because it doesn't lead to suffering. You know? Uh, which is an interesting thing, but evil is bad, because evil leads to suffering. I mean, this is still conventional, because again, good and evil are just part of samsara in the end. True goodness is rising above them, freeing yourself from attachment to, to good deeds in the sense of, oh, I must do more good deeds, or wanting to do more good deeds, right? Even attachment to that will lead you to be reborn in heaven, in nice places, in places that are conducive to, to meditation, but uh, in the end, it can't be a goal in itself. Uh, but still, uh, for your information, good and evil, two different things. Nahi dhammo adhammo cha ubo santa vipakina. Dhamma, the righteousness and unrighteousness, don't have the same result. So, some are born in heaven, some are born in hell. For those of us who practice meditation, it's the example of purifying our minds seeing things clearly and observing and really taking this into account you know if this arahant could do that well we ask ourselves how far we are how much pain how much suffering are we able to tolerate when do we start complaining when we do we start getting upset how patient can we be and and what are we able to be patient with in our practice so this kind of example the, the dhammapada is full of these kind of things that give us good examples in our practice and so a good lesson for that reason. It's also a curious thing because I think many people wouldn't wouldn't have that uh, sense of, of of the sort of the conscientiousness of an of an enlightened being to not betray someone else to not save themselves at the expense of another. So anyway, that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Keep practicing. Be well.